back. And today I'm joined by our good friend, Jeff MD, our very own in-house 007 CIA operative. How's it going out there in Arizona, Jeff? Doing pretty good. I got to be the, the token representative, former representative of three letter agency. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, for those people watching, um, Mike Sterling is on a recon mission to New York City. He's not very happy about it. We just got sent a picture of him. I've never seen him so happy in my life. <laughs> I don't know if you saw the picture or not, Jeff, but he looks pretty sour. So, yeah. No. No. Anyway, me for a second there, but uh, of course we did because this software absolutely sucks, and this <laughs> will be the last time that we use this software. Uh, enough is enough. It's been been uh, not a good experiment. So anyway, getting back on topic. So on Mondays we cherry pick five top stories from the news cycle and relate them to the survival prepping community. So the, the first one that we're going to touch on, and you all have probably seen this, maybe you haven't, but FBI agents have started knocking on people's doors uh, to question them with regards to their social media uh, posts. Uh, one lady had posted something along the lines of FJB. We all know what that means. And, you know, the FBI showed up at her home last week and wanted to, you know, discuss this uh, with her. This isn't new, though. Um, I've got a video clip. And as per usual, I'm not going to force you to sit through and watch all the clips. The links, if you go down below, there's a link to our website. And that page on our website has all the links to everything we're going to show. Suffice it to say that there was a story a while back, uh, probably upwards of a year now, where the FBI had started knocking on people's doors. I'll quickly show you the, the two that we have here. So this one, and they're all in order, by the way, in the article on our website. This is the one that happened last week with the lady uh, who, who they wanted to discuss her social media posts with. And then the other one, which dates back a little bit further, y'all may recognize the screenshot from this, but same thing. So you may recall that I've mentioned in the past that if we look at other Western countries, especially Western Europe, but also Canada, New Zealand, Australia, it's a pretty good crystal ball to tell us what's coming here next. They, they try this stuff in other Western countries before they try it here in America. Firmly believe that a lot of that's predicated on the Second Amendment and that we have a little bit more freedom than the, the other countries. But suffice it to say at the end of the day, the British have been doing this for years. The Australians have been doing this for years. Uh, New Zealanders have been doing this for years where they confront people. And now they've been sending people to jail in Great Britain. There was a story a couple weeks ago. A gentleman got sentenced to two years because he was putting stickers on telephone posts that were anti-migrants. And he, like I said, he got a two-year sentence out of that. So I can't fathom it myself, but... Jeff, what 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 are you, what's your take on this? I mean, coming from a government background, yeah, is, and you know, and I worked I worked with the FBI, not for the FBI, and I worked with them extensively throughout my career. And I have some very good friends that are are were and a lot of them are retired now, rank and file FBI agents, and they are almost exclusively good guys. They are patriots. A lot of them are, are veterans. Uh, they were local cops before they joined the FBI, and they had all the right intentions. I, I haven't talked to them lately. Uh, I, I kind of need to reach out and just see what they think about this. But I think they would be appalled by this because, you know, we all swore a duty to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. And this, to me, strikes me as completely unconstitutional. Yeah, they can ask you questions, but you can also tell them to go past. This guy, if the FBI is listening, they're good. Oh, great. Here we go again with this crappy software. You hung up there, Jeff, for oh. probably a good 15 seconds. Thank okay. God we're getting this software. It's horrible. <laughs> okay. But, you know, the, the, you know, my wife always worries that, you know, because you know, we'll joke around about something. She goes, well, if the FBI is listening, they'll be at the door tomorrow. And, but, and we actually, we've taken steps as to, we put locks on our gates and we have a courtyard and put a lock on that gate. So if anyone's knocking on my front door, that means they had to climb over a wall to get to it. And that's that's a good sign that there's a problem. 
Um, we also have a big steel security door in the front that I can open the door and no one gets access to the house. But, you know, we have both said, we're not going to talk to them. If they come to talk to me or talk to me about one of my neighbors, it's going to be out. I'm not interested. Unfortunately, Mark Lamb, who you've had on the show, is my sheriff. And I've got his phone number on my cell phone. And I would call him and say, okay, Mark, I've got two guys claiming to be FBI outside my house and they won't go away. Um, but most people don't have that luxury. You know, that's interesting you mentioned that. Uh, a couple years back, I did see somebody say, uh, that I don't remember which agency showed up at their door. It may have been ATF, actually, if, if I'm correct. And they called 911, and they said, there's uh, people at my door with guns drawn claiming to be the ATF. I need help. And the either the local PD or sheriff showed up and essentially escorted them off the property. It was a knock and talk. It wasn't serving a warrant. And uh, we just saw an instance was it last week or the week before where the ATF went to question somebody at 6 a.m. in the morning like they always do? And the gentleman had t purchased 12 guns and it ended up in a shootout. And from everything yep. I've read, says that the, the ATF was at fault, not the homeowner. And, and he was essentially murdered. You know, who knows? We'll know when the rest comes out. But you raise a good point because basically, you know, the the purpose of survival dispatch is to dispatch information so our fellow Americans and friends of Americans can survive in these uncertain times. So when we pick something like this from the news cycle, FBI, ATF going door to door, wanting to ask people questions with regards to their social media posts or something else, there's there's really only two scenarios, right? It's, it's they're there to, here we go with this goofy Apple stuff. I have turned this off a thousand times. <laughs> and he just keeps turning well, it off. Oh my God! At least it didn't do confetti all over us. You look festive. Yeah, very. So essentially, they're, they're there for one of two purposes, right? It's a knock and talk. They want to question you, or they're serving, you know, a warrant and they're going to arrest you. So, and I'm not an attorney, but here's my advice: uh, I would ask them if they're there to arrest me. You know, do you have a warrant? Are you here to arrest me? If the answer is no, we know it's a knock and talk at that point in time the best advice you can i can give anybody is just tell them you're not interested in speaking with them and end the conversation now some other people have said to to tell them that they're trespassing and get the f off your property you know i i get it i, I can see the motivation to do something like that but it's potentially going to escalate the situation to a level that it doesn't need to be at there's a time and a place for everything you got a bunch of armed cops at your door. It's probably not the best time to pick a fight with them, sort of no. thing. But Just get them right. off. And you look at this, okay, they, you know, I'm sure they didn't initiate this. They didn't say, hey, I'm going to go harass some people today. You know, their, their supervisory special agents said, okay, we've got orders from on high. We've got to, you know, do X number of these knock and talks. So, you know, be polite and say, look, not really interested. You know, have a good day, but don't choose not to participate. Then if they refuse to get off your property, then you can call the local police or call the local sheriff and say, I've got two men on my property without my permission who are refusing to vacate my property. Can you please come out and escort them off my property? And just say, yeah, and they're armed and they claim to be law enforcement. But they're not. You know, so what's them. interesting is that is the first news story that we pulled up, the, the current one from last week. Uh, apparently... I, it's not in the video, but apparently before the video starts, they offered their identification to the homeowner. She didn't have a chance to look at it. She was putting her dogs away or something to that effect. So when she came outside, she asked them to show their ID and they refused to show it a second time. They said, we've already shown you our ID. And her response was, well, I didn't have a chance to look at it because I was putting the dogs away. I, I mean, the, I think they should have shown it. But, you know, the... Yeah. If it's not a knock and talk, like if they, they're they serving a warrant, just as a standard operating procedure, don't say anything. Invoke your Fifth Amendment rights. Wait until you speak to your attorney. I, I've i mentioned this before. I'll mention it again. Dr. Jennifer Stankus, who's also an attorney, has said on Survival Dispatch News that if an officer gets called into court to testify with regards to your arrest, they are not allowed to say that you invoked your Fifth Amendment. 
So it, it can't even be brought up in, in a court of law. So you can't really be beat over the head with that. So anyway, that's that's story number one. Uh, the FBI essentially and ATF essentially copying the police from other countries, coming to ask people or you know question them, corner them, uh, harass them over their social media posts. Which at the end of the day, if there's been no threat made, there's this thing. It's called the First Amendment. I think it's pretty important since it was put at number one on the list, and they they don't really have much right to use that against us, as far as I'm concerned. No. All right, so let's bring up the the next stuff here. All right, so there, there's two places in the world right now. There's more than two, but there are two places in particular around the world right now that are in dire straits when it comes to food supply and hunger. So one of them is Haiti, and the other one is Gaza. Obviously, very different situations in, you know, in both cases. Uh, Again, our job is to dispatch information to the survival community that's relative to current events. So there's no need to really get into the whole Israel, Palestine, Gaza stuff, really the focus here is food. And I don't know that a lot of people realize just how fragile our system is. So I'll show you a couple more articles that we brought up on this. Here's one of a little girl in Gaza. Uh, begging for food, essentially. And again, all of these are available at the link below on our website. So where we're going with this is that we know unequivocally that the attack on AT&T was just that. It was an attack. It was a cyber attack committed by the, the Chinese. And if you go back and you watch our videos on that, and we had intel specifically from our cyber teams on that, by the way, so the people who said it was a solar flare, solar flares that day hit Europe, not America. So it wasn't that there was no CME, but even if there was a CME, a coronal mass ejection from the sun would affect the entire ionosphere, does not discriminate. It would have taken everything down. Then AT&T said, oh, it was a software update. We reported that it was, in fact, not a software update and that a significant amount of customers data uh, was stolen. And we're, we're going to get a little bit more in depth of that as we go through the news here. But the point I'm trying to make is that our communication networks are fragile. Our power grid is fragile. So if the bad guys take those things down, there's no longer a supply chain because everything today is on JIT just in time. You know, stock level falls to this level in the grocery store. PO goes to the distributor. Bill of lading goes to the logistics company, so on and so forth. Well, if there's no way to communicate that information, there's no food on the way. So you're looking at um, typically three days worth of food on grocery store shelves. We're not that far away from being in a position like Haiti or Gaza where the food supply chain just completely breaks and there's nothing there. And then you end up in the same situation where, you know, if people will beat each other over the head for a Black Friday TV, just imagine what they'll do for food. So, Jeff, you, you're very well traveled. You've been second, third world countries. Fourth world. I'm going to guess that you've probably seen some food emergencies. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, when I was in Afghanistan, we used to, you know, the joke that they're always 15 minutes away from an emergency because uh, depending on the time of year, they don't always have much in stock. And they depended a lot on imports, uh, a lot of which where I was came in from Uzbekistan which is not exactly the most stable of places in the world either. But they had the advantage of not being automated. Um, they did things the old fashioned way. You know, they didn't have phones anyway. But if you look at us, everything is automated to within an inch of its life. So that think about, you think about how many, not phone calls, but you know, emails and you know wire transfers all that stuff that required to bring food to a grocery store and for you to buy it because everything's electronic now very few people actually use cash mm -hmm. all that requires the internet and you know computers talking to each other and access and all that well if that goes down nothing happens even if you went to a grocery store and they had groceries and they had electricity how are they going to process your payment you think they're going to let you walk out with $200 worth of food? And they go, 
credit card is just kind of holding it's pending no right so yeah it's you know we're we that is our weak link we are too technology reliant dependent yeah did you happen to catch uh, in december it was in the lead up to towards christmas that a british gentleman older british gentleman went into one of their grocery stores i think it might have been an aldi and he bought something small I, I can't remember what the product was but candy or something like that and he put cash down on the the conveyor belt and the person running the register said we don't accept cash you know we only accept credit cards debit cards whatever and he said he said do you see this right here it says legal tender on it there you go thank you very much and there was some sort of a threat that they were going to call a security guard or something so he started yelling at everybody hey this product's you know two dollars and i paid the two dollars for it now they're going to sick security on me and walked outside and there were people clapping for him but again uh, what happens there is kind of a, a you know it's a great crystal ball showing you what's going to happen here next well there's already restaurants that refuse to take cash and some places i get it it's a security thing if you don't have cash they can't rob us um but at the same time and oh, joy 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 here this crappy software just froze yeah. again <laughs> but we, you, know, you froze up again jeff okay but i'm just, saying there's some places that don't take cash for, for security reasons because they don't want to get robbed but it says all debts public and private right on our money and if the price on the of whatever you're buying is measured in dollars then you pay for it in dollars um when right. you pay for it with a credit card what's or a debit card the bank is basically fronting them the dollars right up front you're just taking your dollar to the bank and the bank gives it to them it's still a dollar and and so I think we get we're getting into a, again a, a bad place, and of course the government likes it because they, with you know digital currencies and all that crap, they can they can just monitor everything. They know exactly how you spend your money. So uh, before we give some recommendations here, I don't know if you saw this comment or not, Jeff. It's it's a good observation here by Love My Peeps. W what are your thoughts on this? Um. Why aren't they storing up supplies? It's not their business model. So they, it, it, there's the time value of money. And if you, you buy a million dollars worth of green beans and you send them in a warehouse and you, and you dole them out over the course of six months, you're looking at six months of that value of that million dollars. It's cheaper to say, I'll just take it when I need it. And it costs money to warehouse stuff. You've got to have the facilities and you've got to, stock the warehouse so from their perspective it doesn't make sense economically assuming the supply chain holds up the minute the supply chain collapses you're screwed the people who don't who tend to stock up you think about think about the military they stock up weapons they stock up material they stock up ammunition they don't do just in time bomb delivery to the air force somewhere they got warehouses and bunkers full of those things because they know when the war starts you can't trust the you can't trust the logistics system. Yeah, uh, good comments. Here's something that comes to mind. So, uh, back in DFW, I had a client who was in the commercial glazing business. So, uh, commercial windows for high rises, apartments, those sort of thing. They they're not shipped as complete units. They're shipped as all the in individual components. So, you know, your glass, your beads your frames, everything gets shipped in raw materials. And then it gets manufactured by the glazing company and then sent to the job site to be installed on a very strict critical path because you don't want your glass getting wrecked and those sort of things. So one of my clients there had, it was a huge number. I don't remember the exact number, but I wanna say it was somewhere around $23 million in fines for breaking the critical path, not meeting the dates on some very large projects. And there were a bunch of young MBAs in this boardroom, you know, 30 years old, let's say, and a handful of us who actually had, you know, decades of experience under our belts. And the CEO had this, this thumb drive. And after everybody had given all these excuses as to why 
you know, they couldn't meet these deadlines and why they had $23 million in fines and why his reputation was being ruined. He handed this thumb drive to the guy who was running the laptop on the projector. And he said, I want you to, you know, bring up uh, these spreadsheets. So he started saying how before, when they used to bring in supplies three months in advance, then they would stage them from a warehouse to their production facility and then take them on site at 4 a.m. the morning of whatever it was to be installed and how this process was. And of course, all of the MBAs were like, well, you'd be paying interest on line of credit. That's just not the way we visit. It's got to be JIT. And he said, well, your JIT is destroying my company's reputation and it's costing us more work. And they said, well, we still saved you money. And he asked the guy, he said, flip to the second tab in the spreadsheet. And it was a comparison of what the warehousing and transportation costs would have been versus their model. It was about $8 million. So he would have saved about $15 million by having the stock on hand three months in advance so he could sleep well at night versus and paying on a line of credit for it versus this just in time model. So love my peeps. Legit question. Good question. I, I, my answer to it would be Keith or sorry, Jeff, is that, yeah, that, that's not their model anymore. And, you know, as time goes on and, and those of us come out of the workforce that have this experience, everybody else is trained. This is the way it's done. It, it becomes a, you know, a bad deal. So anyway, at the, at the end of the day, as, as far as uh, the hunger issue is concerned, you know, there, there's not a whole lot that we can say other than stack up on your preps now and keep it to yourself. Uh, do you have anything else to add to that, Jeff? No. Um, well, other than the fact we're letting uh, MBAs and, C and uh, CPAs ruin our economy. Um, but no, you, assume it's not going to be there. Um, and, uh, you know, I would almost go to the grocery store thinking, OK, if nothing is going to be here next week, what do I need now? And how long can I can I survive with what I have and build up? If you can't afford to do it, a lot of people can't build up slowly. I just sent yeah. my wife out and I said, 10 pound bag of white rice and a 10 pound bag of pinto beans. They last forever and they'll keep you alive in a pinch. Yeah, I, I mean, that's actually good advice for sure. We go, we go to Sam's and look for stuff that's you know, on special. And then my wife will take every last package that's there when it's on special, you know, Especially staples. And then we, yeah, we freeze it, we freeze dry it, those sort of things. So let's, let's move on to the next topic, which is actually going to be a little bit of a, a, a preview of what's coming up on Wednesday's episode, survival dispatch. And that is the prospect of uh, terrorist drone attacks here on in the homeland. So this video, again, all the links are at the link in the description on our website, is one that we released just after 10-7 last October. We had received intel that uh, Hezbollah, Hamas, and other terrorist groups had plans to utilize drones to attack open-air venues, whether they be, you know, would drop aerosolized anthrax, aerosolized, aerosolized fentanyl, pardon me, and, you know, the, the, the pundits came out of the woodwork slinging arrows at us. It was exactly one day to the week later, there was an RFP released on SAM.gov request for proposal. And SAM.gov is where all federal contracts are awarded and managed. It stands for supply and management. Looking for EMP weapons that could be mounted on drones to take out enemy drones. So we've got a, a pretty big episode coming here on Wednesday. We have Admiral Robert Harwood coming on, who is a preeminent subject matter expert in this field. His father was also a pioneer, and he was an admiral in the Navy as well. Uh, Jeff has met him. We, we had a planning session that we did together. This is a really, really crazy subject because at the end of the day, we, we don't have any defenses. So this headline says it all. The U.S. is defenseless against a drone terror attack. And we'll get into a lot more specifics on Wednesday when the admiral joins us. We also have... Uh, Eric McMillan from U.S. Arms Co. joining us. He's an engineer and has a fair bit of experience when it comes to drones. Here's another one, another article. They're all over if you want to search on this that, you know, there's major concern. All you have to do is watch what's going on in Ukraine. It's uh, it's unbelievable. And here's another one. 
on non-state actors, so terrorists essentially using drones to attack us. And then there's a PDF linked in here as well. It's many pages long that runs the full gamut on how vulnerable we are to drone attacks. At the end of the day, there's no good defense in place from anybody. If you watch the FPV drones, so first person view drones that are being used in Ukraine, you can see them chasing Russian soldiers, soldiers around tanks and other uh, you know objects and killing them. There's no getting away from these things. If you, especially if you're in the open, we the intel that we had last year indicating that terrorist groups wanted to attack open air venues is still there and using payloads again like aerosolized biological weapons or chemicals so jeff we just had this planning session earlier today without completely letting the cat out of the bag give me give me your thoughts on this it's it's a brutal topic it it is and it's a it's an ugly topic um and what makes it uglier is the fact that there probably isn't a whole lot we can do about it right now um don't want to give any bad guys any ideas but and even if the attack itself is relatively small, think of the panic that it would that that it would release if you know you had just a hand grenade going off in a football stadium with a hundred thousand people in it. Yeah, you might kill eight or ten, but how many are going to get are going to die getting trampled to death trying to get the hell out of there? You, know, you see it. I mean, the, the Who rock concert in Cincinnati for crying out loud. It was a rock concert. And how many people were killed with that? They were just trying to get to see the, to watch the band. Now imagine 100,000 people trying to flee. It would be, it would be a nightmare. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. A lot of bang for a little buck. Yeah, th- I mean, again, we're trying not to let the cat out of the bag because we want to, you know, dive in. We're going to dive in depth on this topic with the Admiral. And, and it was a, I listened actually to the Admiral and Eric and Jeff speak more and just kept fairly quiet through that because they know a lot more than me, but as they were mentioning certain things, so I'll let one little small cat out of the bag. Israel is currently using drones that are AI powered, that are not under humans control, that are mapping out the tunnels in Gaza and killing people as they go. And, you know, Theoretically, the AI is to identify Hamas members and kill them. But we just had an incident last week where one of the Israeli drones took out a vehicle with some UN observers in it that that shouldn't have been attacked. It's Skynet level stuff. It's scary stuff. It's Skynet level. And yeah, we want to do the best that we can against the bad guys, but we really have no defense against the bad guys turning this technology on us. And again, we'll get into that deeper uh, suffice it to say right now that, that the prospect of fentanyl is, is is pretty stark. It's in the intel that we've received. So we've mentioned this before. We'll mention it again. Go to nextdistro.org, select your state. That will connect you to the agency that hands out Narcan for free. Uh, I went on a Sunday last year, and by Tuesday it was in my mailbox. Two boxes with two doses at the maximum dose, four milligrams each. Learn to recognize the symptoms of fentanyl so if your heart rate accelerates and you feel like you're having an anxiety attack it probably is an anxiety attack because fentanyl decreases the oxygen in your blood that goes to your brain and the exact opposite happens your heart rate will plummet you will feel intoxicated you will fall down so if you see that happening to other people you feel it happening to yourself that's the time to grab a narcan dose out of your edc and administer it to yourself immediately. Beyond that, honestly, like the the advice is if you see drones, seek immediate cover, deep cover, you know, not getting inside of a vehicle because the drones have enough payload that they can blow that up. So Mike Sterling, it's gotta be going on two years now, we were discussing urban survival, said that you've gotta get your head wrapped around the fact that you're not just paying attention to X Y axes like this, but also the Z axis vertical, you know, always checking what's overhead. I I can tell you that my youngest son is serving at Fort Benning. He's an instructor. He's training five man squads on what to do if they are confronted by a low altitude drone. We're not talking 
ISRs and predators that are five, 10,000 feet up there. Again, just go to X and check out the videos on what Ukraine is doing with drones against the Russians. This is pretty discouraging. The current SOP is that our troops are to throw a smoke bomb on the ground and seek cover. Well, all of these drones have thermal imaging capabilities. A smoke bomb is not going to hide your signature, just like, you know, revealing game like hogs when you're hunting at night. The, the Your heat signature will give you up. And then the second part to it is, is okay, shoot it down with your duty weapon, a 5.56. Five, Anybody knows how hard it is to shoot birds out of the air. Just imagine how hard it is to shoot drones down. So, Jeff, we did have a discussion before we move on. We did have a discussion earlier today with the Admiral and Eric that it is against the law to shoot drones down because they're considered aircrafts. Does yeah. that apply in this case here from Kevin's question? You know, is it, is it legal to fly them over private property? Because technically, as far as Eric was concerned, and he's right, you can't shoot them down. No, uh, and I think there's a, one of the issues is how low are they? I mean, if they're outside your bedroom window, I think you can probably get away with it. And then they'll just arrest you for discharging a weapon inside city limits. Uh, but the other thing is there's a lot of people who are flying drones for legitimate purposes. Um, I actually saw a video yesterday of some guy, someone was a drone over his house and he was getting ready to get a shotgun out and shoot it down. And he went out to look and it turned out to be the power company. They were inspecting the power lines with a drone so they didn't have to get up there with a bucket truck. So if he'd have shot that one out of the sky, he'd have been. And here we go again. <laughs> God, thank God we're done with this offer. This is the last time survival dispatch. Drone photos of it. You know, and that's a legitimate, that's a legitimate unit. You hung up again, Jeff. Just just thank the Lord that we're done with the software after today. <laughs> Interesting, there are legitimate reasons for people to fly drones. They, you know, again, the one I saw was the power company inspecting electric lines. Mm -hmm. uh, it's cheaper and quicker and easier for them to use a drone. And it's 100% legal. Was it you or Eric or the Admiral who said that, uh, you know, somebody could be flying a drone, gathering, uh, you know, intel on your property like recon that because they're going to break into your home later on oh, and make a claim that they're just doing uh, aerial photography for real estate purposes or something like that. Yeah. I mean, if if I want to rob your house and I, I don't and you've got neighbors around, but I want to say, OK, does, does he have kids? Does he have a dog? Does he have a swimming pool? Well, I just fly over in a drone, see what's out there. If you got a Rottweiler, I go, maybe not that house. Yeah, exactly. So, all right, before we move on to the next topic, just so a DSIM 3 knows, we're using software called Streamlabs. We open a number of tickets. I'm a certified in the world, and we were able to trace this actually back to their data center. They do not have enough cpu power to chew through all of the traffic that's being sent their way so it looks like a network latency issue but in reality it's a data center issue the good news is this is the last time we're using this software for the foreseeable future so all right let's move move on to the next one and this is where we come back to the at&t data breach so as i mentioned earlier you know we were given it hard intel that it was a chinese cyber attack and some people, you know, wanted to say it was a, you know, solar flares. They hit Europe. They didn't hear. Then they wanted to say it was a CME. It can't be a CME because if it was a CME, one, we would know. And two, it would have affected everything around the world. And AT&T's official story that it was a software update doesn't hold water because T-Mobile and Verizon were also affected. Now, Verizon in particular here in the southeast. And we also reported at that time that our sources had told us that there was a massive data breach on the part of AT&T when, when the Chinese broke into their network. Lo and behold, this past weekend, AT&T kind of quietly announces that many millions of customers and former customers' data is now accessible on the dark web. That is the data that came from the cyber attack last month that took the AT&T network down. So, I mean, they're, they, their anticipation is, is that people will believe the official narrative when, thank goodness in this day and age, we have access to information that we did not have in years gone by. So, Jeff, give me your thoughts on 
we've got this intel saying that there's going to be additional attacks on our communication networks. We've already discussed what it does to the supply chain, but give us the the 30,000 foot view in your opinion of the vulnerability and the fallout from this. Well, the vulnerability is that we're, we're constantly, because we are constantly upgrading, checking, redoing, and, you know, putting in patches, you never know the status of the system. And, you know, you're a network guy, you understand that. The more new software you put in it, the more vulnerabilities you potentially have. But if they can get into the phone system, they get into the internet, they can disrupt bank transfers. They can, you know, how many people pay their bills online? Okay, what if they go in and they just delete your account or, you know, zero it out? How long would it take you and the bank to figure that out and get it restored? They can disrupt everything. I mean, if they get into SCADA systems, they can open switches and close switches and screw up with the power grid as well, because that's all controlled by computer systems that talk to each other over the Internet. Maybe encrypted, but it's over the Internet. They mess that up. We're in, we're in trouble. Yeah, I mean, it's it's there are pros and cons to everything, right? And the first thing in life you do is decide what you're willing, what you want. And the second thing is what you're willing to give up to get it. So if you want the ease of all this online stuff, what you're giving up is some element of security. And as far as this AT&T breach is concerned, and, and it won't be the last one, if you are an AT&T customer or were previously, change your passwords. It's best practice anyway. Change your passwords so that data cannot be used to access your account make unauthorized changes. The next part to it though, in, and we keep preaching some of the same things, right? Get your food preps in order. Well, get your communications preps in order as well. And you know where Jeff is and west of him, you can get some crazy long distances from handheld radios and mobile radios. You're not gonna get that here in the Southeast unless you happen to be you know, in Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, North Carolina, and you're at the top of a mountain. So things are pretty, you know, relatively speaking, pretty flat here in central Florida. And we do have, you know, maybe 50 foot changes in elevation in our neighborhood. But radios won't penetrate solid objects, you know, whether it be trees, buildings or whatever the case may be. We have a 38 foot tower right outside my office right there. And we struggle to get 10 mile range with anywhere from 50 to 100 watt mobile radios. And that's with decent radio antennas on the vehicles as well. It, it's a tough deal. We're going to go to business class radios next, by the way, so we can get away from UHF, go to VHF, and hopefully have the ability to bounce off of, you know, the atmosphere and those sort of things. Also, because it's a lower range, you need a, a much shorter antenna can give you the same type of power as something that's in a higher range, like that 462, 467 megahertz. So on that topic, pardon me, Jeff, what are your advice for comms? Uh, the only thing I'll add to it is we're big fans of the Garmin inReach services. I have an inReach mini. Uh, I paid for it myself and it's got one button SOS. I can tether it to my phone. I can send and receive text messages from it. Here we go with the thumbs up stuff. <laughs> uh, I pay 12, 12 bucks a month to have satellite connectivity at a bare minimum. I think that's a great solution for the price. Yeah, I mean, so if you can if you can afford satellite, um, that's you know, generally I would think the way to go. Um, and if you have, like, say, you know, Starlink, you know, you can do VoIP from your home because you're not going to be you know tethered to the cell phone companies or anything mm -hmm. like that. Uh, your radio comment about Arizona, I'd say, not accurate because we have a lot of hills. Uh, I've got GM GMRS radios, and I went out drove around and was testing them with my wife at home. And I've got coverage in this valley where I live. Once you get beyond that, it goes away because we got the mountains and it won't go through the rock. Uh, if I was yeah, on top of the hill shooting, I might do better. So, yeah, just to qualify my comment there, one was having line of sight from the top of a mountain. And two, you guys actually have repeaters out there for GMRS. There's virtually nothing here in the southeast for repeaters like you guys have. And then go from, you know, Arizona to California. They have the largest repeater network in the world. It's all citizen built. We just had we have nothing here. Like, I mean, nothing there. Our county that I live in has two GMRS repeaters 
and one of them's about 15 miles away and the other one's 25 miles away and they're both private they're not for public use anyway but i I can't connect to them no matter what anyway so anyway that's just just to qualify the comment on gmrs so let's move on to the next one which uh you know has been in the news a fair these uh, bridge collisions you know started with baltimore last week had a couple more instances over the course of the weekend uh, oklahoma and arkansas where uh, a barge you know hit a pylon those sort of things there have been 18 major bridge collapses since 1960. i, I don't know what the number of you know crashes are like the ones over the weekend that didn't bring the bridges down but suffice it to say it it this sort of catastrophic stuff is once in a blue moon at best. Then on top of that, and more, we don't have any theories on this, by the way, but there's a lot of stuff out there. People saying you're reporting that the black box from the ship is missing a chunk of time as to when it crashed. There's all kinds of conspiracy theorists. I am not accusing general Mike Flynn of being a conspiracy theorist, but he has some questions. You know, he questions the validity of the official story of how this accident happened. And if nothing else, Jeff, it seems to me that if this was not a, say, a terrorist attack or hack on that system, it's got to be on their radar now to think, hey, if we just jack up some ports, we can do even more damage to the supply chain. Plus, we can take all of the local economic stuff you know, and shut it down. I mean, the, the economic consequences for people who work in Baltimore are going to be pretty extreme. So, yeah, I mean, it, give me give me your thoughts on that. It seems to me, I mean, like I said, it's not new. I mean, you look, look there at, you go. You, know, you look at World War Two. You know, after D-Day, you know, we were driving to take Antwerp because it was the biggest port on the North Sea. It was in Belgium, huge port, huge facilities. Germans mined the hell out of it and blew up everything. We did that port wasn't opening, wasn't open for business for months, and it's and it slowed down our invasion because it was the easiest, best way to get. They did the same thing to the port of, of Calais in the Pas de Calais. They they blew it up, they mined it, they made it unusable to us. We did it to the Japanese. Um, I mean, during World War II, it's it's standard wartime tactic. You know, just you know, destroy their ability to import what they need. Um, and when you have a major port, like Baltimore is a major port, what mm-hmm. blows me away is how many of our major ports have we built bridges that if you drop the bridge, you've cut off the port? I mean, anything like that, yeah, it should be a right? tunnel. I mean, Norfolk, you know, our biggest Navy base is in Norfolk. If you get on a Google Earth and look, there ain't no bridges between where the boats are and where the open ocean is. There's a tunnel but there's no bridges. Yeah. So you can't drop a bridge and bottle up a fleet, but that's just us being too cheap to spend the money. The same thing up there, they were going to put uh, pier fenders and they shot it down because they said it cost too much. And here we go again. Apologies to our audience one more time. He <laughs> froze up again, Jeff. The good news is we're almost at the end of this broadcast. Yeah, and I promise the last. last time we use this crappy software. <laughs> <laughs> just give us the last little bit that you were sharing there. Well, I was just saying that in in Baltimore they were going to put uh, pier fenders. They had proposed putting pier fenders to protect the piers from ships, and okay. they didn't do it because it, they said it was too expensive. So how much are they going to spend now? I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars are they going to have to spend? to replace that bridge now or replace it with a tunnel. Yeah, well, yeah, anyway, so it, foolish. yeah. So it's not only what, what they're going to spend. It's also what's being lost as a result of it in economic activity, which is, yeah. you know, pretty, pretty punishing. So I wish we had more in depth information on, you know, these bridge incidents, but we don't, as soon as we do, we will, you know, happily share it. And the only, you know, recommended action that we can come up with is to pay attention to non-mainstream media that has a track record of being honest and not you know making up tinfoil hat stories and that's probably where the the truth will come out the truth always comes out eventually so 
And asking questions isn't a conspiracy theory. You know, being right. skeptical doesn't make you a conspiracy theorist. It just says, okay, the official narrative is A. Could it be something else? And I think we've learned during like the pandemic that there were a lot of things that we should have been a hell of a lot more skeptical skeptical about much earlier in that in that whole process. So, but ask questions. There's nothing wrong with asking questions. Yeah, it may be you may be right, you may be wrong. Ask some questions, find out, and wait for the information to come out. I, I wish I could remember who to attribute this to, but when I was a teenager, somebody said to me uh, that there's no such thing as a stupid question. And the person who said it to me was was said it basically in this, you know, uh, I'll say it in the as if they were addressing me, but there's no such thing as a stupid question. I've never met the person who knows everything or knows nothing at all. So, you know, it's there's there's no harm in asking questions for sure. You know what? In the grand scheme of things, if somebody thinks you're stupid, they're it'll be forgotten in 30 seconds anyway. Who yeah. gives a shit, right? So uh, I got to address this just because Flingshot uh, made a comment here. And for those people who uh, maybe haven't been following Survival Dispatch for a long period of time or are not familiar with this, uh, I competed on our national powerlifting team. I competed 181, 198, 220, 242, 275, set a bunch of state, national, and world records over the years in bench press. And I can assure you both of my arms are the exact same size. It's not an optical illusion. Well, it is an optical illusion. Then. And, and yes, that's my full ego on display, world champ. You know, I've had that ink for many, many years. So at 55 years old, going on 15 still. So, <laughs> all right, Jeff, is there anything else uh, that we want to share? Are there any questions in the sidebar here? There you go. Sun's out, gun's out. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, are there any other questions that we need to address here from the comment section, or are we going to call it a wrap? Yeah, I think, yeah, it looks pretty good. So, I, so listen I, to the mainstream media and get the opposite, of, the opposite of the truth. I have to agree with Unforeseen Outdoors here that there comes a point in time when the chances of all of this just being on accident just doesn't hold water any further. And, well, you of all people would know that, you know, when you're, collapsing a society the the rouge of things happening is the important part in reality well, and plan behind the scenes but on the flip side the more complex a system is probably the easier it is to take down because it's got so many moving parts and so many uh, points of failure you know if you have a something with a single point of failure and you can protect and fortify that single point it's much harder to bring down but if you have something that if you take down any one of 20 nodes and it's going to fall apart. It's harder to protect 20 nodes than it is one. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. All right, y'all. Uh, we will leave you with this. That uh, Tune in on Wednesday, 4 p.m. Eastern time. You can look up uh, Admiral Robert Harwood will be joining us. An amazing career. Not only do you have an amazing career, he is widely regarded by every other SEAL as the greatest SEAL of all time. He's a phenomenal man. He's going to share some incredible knowledge with us when it comes to drones being used by terrorists, as well as some warfare stuff that transfers over to terrorists. Jeff will be on that uh, episode and Eric McMillan, the CEO of U.S. Arms Co., who's a really top notch engineer and drone guy. It's a scary subject. And I like to say that we have more information, which we do. What we don't have is a how you protect yourself because nobody's cracked that nut as of yet. Jeff, appreciate your time. Oh, my pleasure, sir. Thank you, everybody out there in survival dispatch land. We will see you on Wednesday.